I did not only see, but was a victim of a war. My brother and sisters were killed. I was the only one left to survive. If God can save my life, let him forgive my enemy. Plain in his heart, my love, let my land no war. Stephen, like millions of young people around the world, live in a state of chaos, whether because of war and conflict or natural disasters. The reason of me writing my this print is war is very bad. During the war in Nigeria, we lose a lot of people, educated people that want to help our Indian nation. And I pray that Nigeria should have no war again. However, in the midst of these great difficulties, young people fight to survive. They mobilize to form youth groups, conduct peer education activities, contribute to peace movement, and help rehabilitate their communities. Like Stephen, they learn to overcome hardships and strive to become productive members of their societies. Crucial as these stories are, most of them are never heard. Will you listen? You travel there, you get in Kimata, where I was born. Yeah. These are designs that are made, you know, so that when people enter the room and see it, and again, you, you know, they get excited. Yeah, a Liberian flag, or where to prove that I'm a Liberian, I'm proud to be a Liberian. And she makes history, she's the first female president ever, yeah, in the African, you know, the African race, and then in our republic, she's the first female president. In Liberia, Wolokwai and several of his peers travel from around this small West African nation to partake in a poetry and creative writing workshop to discuss how youth had been affected by the country's 14-year civil war. Thank you so much for coming. Their discussions focused on how their schooling had been affected. Schools were burned, teachers were displaced, and many missed out on years of their education. Wolokwai, who lost his father during the war and without any family income, was unable to continue with school. You know, as soon as I, I entered the school, my father died, paying some of my school fees and leaving some. So then, you know, I had a green part on me. My average went down as low as 79. I felt bad. I felt that I was getting dull. My father is gone, but now, same I'm K. Wolokwe S. Davis, I can live more than William B. Davis. That was my father's name. And then I took on that, I said, I will put the past behind me, and then I will live. And then I will do it, I will prove to people that I will help my people. I will learn, and then learn to the best of my ability. Learn beyond my expectation. I remember the first day I get in the as a refugee. Olukwai's friend, Fatumatu, had an equally difficult time completing her education. During the conflict in neighboring Sierra Leone, she fled with her mother to Liberia for safety, only to face another war. Like so many displaced young people, she spent most of her childhood in a refugee camp. My sleeping area, I sleep here, and then a storeroom here. I started my education in this camp from the second grade to the 10th grade before I leave. And then we used to be on the school building where you find roaches around, 
Sometimes the rain falling on us, nowhere to go. She's now studying to be a nurse, thanks to the support from her uncle, who lives closer to town. Knock, knock. Yes. Hello. Yeah, hello. Let's go to the police. When she's not at school or doing homework, Fatumatu is also a drama teacher, where she works with former campmates to write and perform skits for other young people still living in the camp. Two days ago, I raped my daughter, my only child. Fatumatu's play brings to light one of the most serious issues facing young women in conflict sexual violence. <laughs> In other parts of the world, gender-based violence takes on another face, including intimate partner abuse and politically motivated violence. Aquí en Colombia se maneja mucho lo que es el poder. En este país, quien tiene un arma se cree grande. Creo que las mujeres son las mayores afectadas. Primero, porque son asesinados sus su compañeros. Segundo, porque muchas veces aquí en Colombia el abuso sexual es como que uno de los problemas más grandes que tiene nuestro país. Aquí la violencia contra la mujer es algo que se ha visto como que, como que el pan de cada día. E incluso en la comunidad en la que estoy trabajando actualmente se ha visto el abuso hacia la mujer. Eh, ya le dije, no solamente el maltrato físico, sino también el maltrato psicológico. Pero además de eso, el maltrato a nivel sexual, eh, como pareja. Eh, de pronto, el hecho de que las personas hayan salido de sus tierras a sitios desconocidos, a sitios que de pronto nunca antes habían explorado, eh, la situación económica, eh, la falta de oportunidad de trabajo y el estar acostumbrados a trabajar en sus tierras, eso de una u otra forma genera el hecho de que haya violencia dentro de la familia. Women and girls are personally affected by armed violence. They are widowed or lose loved ones and often themselves become targets of violence. For 17-year-old Maria, Violence had a direct impact on her family. Her father and her aunts and uncles had been killed. Amaury, Danison, Oscar, Nagis, and Emerson. Five of them With a deceased father and an absentee mother, Maria was primarily raised by her grandmother and aunts, relying on their guidance for her healthy development as a young woman. Eh, bueno, ella es mi hermosa abuelita María Navarro, que la quiero mucho, te mucho, te mucho. <ríe> Yo todavía eh, me pregunto y, y sí, siempre me va a preguntar, o sea, ¿por qué tantas cosas en contra de nosotros? ¿Por qué tanta guerra y tanta desgracia en mi familia? Eh, bueno, mi abuelita, yo puse en la nota que la admiraba porque sí. No sé de dónde ha sacado tantas fuerzas y tanta berraquera para salir adelante. Y para sacar a tantos nietos adelante, porque sinceramente no sé. Por eso la admiro bastante. Eh, la fuerza que en mí yo pienso que es la injusticia. Eso me da más ganas de, de seguir y de que la, las mujeres no sean golpeadas tanto por por tanta guerra, por tanta violencia, por tantos maltratos físicos y psicológicos. Porque nosotros podemos y hay que llevar la delantera con positivo, con positivismo, con actitud y verraquera. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, I'm called Tim Densale. Yeah, this is my place. Uh, it is in Gulo district in Uganda. I'm 17 years old. Yes. In northern Uganda, 20 years of war have left young men like Dennis lacking formal employment opportunities. Washing cars and motorcycles not only gives him small income, but keeps him from engaging in high risk activities. Yeah, I worked in one to sunset. 
What I like most about the work is it keeps me busy, not to let me think of going to do something bad like go on drinking, smoking, what, what, what. It keeps me busy all the time. My mind always be fresh. Dennis is one of many young people who were forced to fight for the Lord's Resistance Army during the ongoing conflict in northern Uganda. The, the war, the guerrilla war made by Coin Joseph in northern Uganda has a lot of effects on the side of the young people. Here you find that during the war, the rebel can come and abduct young people. These children will go and grow up in the bush. They are trained to be a soldier. Many, 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 many of you, some of them died in the bush. And some of the parents doesn't know where their children are. Because some of them have died, some of them are still there with them. Except some of us who are, we have um, escaped from them. I was carrying luggage with my head. So they shoot at it, the bullet shoot on me. I was bleeding seriously. I heard the sound of a vehicle coming. I stand by the road, I raise my hand up, I have then the stop. Put me in the vehicle, for me to bring me to the hospital. It is how I escaped. Yeah, it was been hard. <laughs> very, very hard. After several months of counseling and recovering from injuries to his thumb and ankle, Dennis returned home. Like so many young people in Africa, he lives as an orphan, raised by his grandparents. So, yeah, this has a grand. So, this is uh, this one, this side, is for my mom. So, on the next side is uh, my aunt, the sister to my mother. No, my parents didn't die in the war. My parents died when I was still at the uh, age of four years. Actually, what caused them to die, I don't know too much, but as they've tried to tell me, I think so, maybe it would be the uh, effects of HIV, so, yeah. So, but I tried to talk to my grandmom, then she told me, yeah, because for them, you know, they fear yeah, not to tell people that uh, your parents did this, this. Then I tried to talk to her slowly. She accepted, she told me that it HIV. For Dennis, being held in captivity opened his eyes to the realities of HIV and AIDS transmission, both for himself and for other young people. For ladies, when they have that, they take them, they are giving you just a husband. Even if you are young or what, they just give you. If it's an old man of 40, 50 years, they just give like that. I just go and rape them, sleep just with them like that. See, those are such kind of things that uh, made HIV now to be so worse in this end. Conflict affected populations, particularly youth, are made more vulnerable to HIV infection due to political instability, widespread human rights abuses and violence, and lack of youth friendly reproductive health services and information. Uh, right now, we are in Gulu Youth Center. Yeah, this place almost accommodates uh, quite a good number of youth. Yeah, it always uh, helps us because sometimes it comes here like for testing because they know even how to talk to youth. So they are used to us, you know. So long as we come here, just feel comfortable with them. Yeah. It was uh, 2003. That was the year that I escaped from. I tested till up to now, keeping on testing. But I'm still safe. Yeah. Every day we hear of conflicts occurring, with the majority taking place in the developing world. But even more developed countries are not free from emergencies. Natural disasters, which equally uproot the lives of young people, do not discriminate between the haves and the have-nots as experienced in 2005 in the United States with the onslaught of Hurricane Katrina. It looked like the end of the world. 
people were here on roofs. It was a very scary experience. Jennifer is a 25-year-old college student who works as a healthcare assistant at the Tulane Community Healthcare Center. What I do here mostly is I triage patients. I'm more of a counselor to them, I assist doctors with whatever they need. I like your shoes. <laughs> A lot of young people that come here, they come here mostly to get basic medical attention, either it be prophylactic methods like birth control or condoms. I'm just basically here to help the community in a city that doesn't really have too good of a healthcare system. After the hurricane, the majority of healthcare centers were closed and young people in particular were left without reproductive healthcare services. We are displaced around Houston, Atlanta, Baton Rouge, Utah. Emergencies often increase high-risk sexual behaviors, which can lead to unwanted pregnancies, social stigmatization of young mothers, unsafe abortions, or contracting sexually transmitted infections and HIV and AIDS. I was interested in, in whether you think uh, there's any connection between the post-Katrina phase and the level of teenage pregnancy, the pressure for people to have sex. My friend that was pregnant, like, she's still going out doing it more because she doesn't have a job either. And she feel like the only way she can earn money is to have sex with people. It's kind of like the prostitute job, but yeah. You know, um, and I think that sex was affected by that too because they were, you know, kind of you bored. <laughs> what do you do, you know? Vanessa who became a teenage mother at age 15, cancels all the young women who get pregnant. You know, I think that teenage pregnancy is a big issue, and I think that a lot of people might have decided that, whoa, you know, you know, if things can happen like that, well, maybe um, I should have sex with my boyfriend. Yeah, and that's why I think, like, the clinic should have more information available to them, because even if a disaster is going on or if violence is breaking out, it's still, they're still going to be a part of their life regardless. They're still going to be doing things and they're still going to need somebody to talk to and they're still going to need a place to go to get the information and protection that they need. First thing that comes to me would be Go back, what did he say? Uh, he said, uh, <laughs> what, what are you doing? <laughs> this is a country of conflicts. Well, what you have to hear where I come from, and then you'll know. Um, <clears throat> Sierra Leone, you, you may not know, brother, but it's a small country in West Africa. And in 1991, we had, we had a terrible war that lasted for 11 years. I saw in Sierra Leone what it meant. I saw how my sisters, my cousins, people that I loved, were sexually abused and raped. And I saw houses being burned. I saw schools being burned. I have lived and seen what it means when a society decides to not give a voice to its young people. And uh, yes. Wow. Okay. Uh, Exposure to extreme violence is known to cause immense emotional distress to adolescents and children. I just want to hear how you think war affects your lives as young people. Misam is a 20-year-old student in Beirut who was visiting his parents' home located in Tyra City, southern Lebanon, when Lebanon's 2006 war began. Um, you can see the cracks in this wall uh, due to the bombs that were thrown be beside the building here. And there are also another crack here that's well visible. When the bombs and helicopters were circling above, Wissam, his family, and some neighbors took shelter in their basements. And we don't have uh, enough matrices, so there was a law. Uh, matrices are just for the children. Women, men will sleep on the floor. 
And once I was looking at the children sleeping, I can't forget that image. So I decided with my sister, since we have a camera, a digital cam, let's take photos. Uh, we started uh, doing uh, like funny stuff. I was just trying to live or to do something uh, because we were so depressed. Honestly, we were inside, we were so depressed. Maybe if we died and then the media will come here and see us dead, they can find the cam and they can see us that we were civilians, we were peaceful, and we were killed for no reason. <laughs> And I was asking, what do they fight? What for? Life is not worth to fight for it. You are going to lose it, you are going to die someday. So try to live it. Go. So, I don't know, sing, dance, bring colors to people, let people meet, give love to everyone, smile. This is life, this is what it's nice. I didn't believe in brotherhood. Instead, I wanted to fight, and if I could, I would. I ran away and helped them instead. Today, I'm stronger and not afraid. Now, I'm up for peace or anything alive. Enough bloodshed, life is a one-time strike. Despite ongoing wars and disasters, that affect and displace millions of young people each year, many are resilient and have consistently risen up to meet the challenges of finding peace and harmony in a chaotic world. We some join the peace movement that promotes non-violence. Maria works with other young people to fight violence against women. Jennifer continues helping young people access reproductive health services. Dennis donates blood and cancels young people on the risk of HIV and AIDS. Uh, so this is a card uh, which we normally been given if we donated blood. For Wolokwai, the inspiration he received from his principal helped him reach his goal of becoming a third grade school teacher. The 12th grade, my principal knew that I was very brilliant, so he called me to live with him. And I lived with him, and then I graduated safely with all paying your dime. I said, I will teach the degree. And he said, okay, you can do it. I said, I can do it. So, you know, I gave them a motivation that was, that was given to me some time ago. So I said, if you learn and you be more like me, you will teach other people so they get very excited and learn. Yeah.